Hi. Uh, so today we're going to look at several different cycles of matter. Uh, we're going to start with the water cycle. Uh, obviously, water is very important for life on Earth because, well, all cells contain water and water is an essential ingredient in photosynthesis. So let's just get going with this. Uh, so basically, the water cycle refers to the movement of water molecules from the ocean or other uh, surface uh, surfaces, uh, water surfaces, into the atmosphere and then back down to the surface of the Earth. And the thing to know about it, the first thing you need to know about it is it's powered by the sun. So it's a solar powered system. Essentially what happens is light energy from the sun hits the surface of the earth, making it warm. This is causes uh, water molecules to vibrate more rapidly and causes them to uh, uh, move into the air. Now uh, it's, it's powered, I guess you would say, uh, by a process called convection. So convection is basically the upward movement of hot uh, fluids, gases or liquids, in this case gases, and the downward movement of cooled uh, gases or liquids. And so what happens is the sun hits the ground uh, and the ground absorbs that light energy and gets hot. So the atoms right at the surface of the ground are hot. The air that is in contact with them gets energy transferred to it, which is shown in this diagram here. Hot air expands, and as air expands, it becomes less dense. So heated air being less dense is lofted upward, uh, and that process is called convection. Now, similarly, as it moves upwards, uh, it will also get cold, and that will cause it to sink back to the ground. I think I have that in the next slide. So basically, as, as solar energy is absorbed by the ground, the ground gets hot, the air next to the ground gets hot, hot air becomes less dense, it floats upwards. As it does, there is a process known as adiabatic cooling happens. Basically what happens is the pressure drops as it moves up, and when the pressure drops, the atoms do work pushing outwards, and that means their internal energy goes down, so they get cold. And they, when they get cold, they sink back down to the ground, and you get this circular vertical loop called a convection current, or a convection cell, either one. And so these convection cells are basically the, the power source for moving water molecules uh, on our planet. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if I take the atoms here where it's hot and the air is rising upwards, if, well, if I remove molecules by lifting them upwards through convection, that means there's fewer molecules here. Well, fewer molecules means less pressure. So in areas where we have warm air rising, we tend to have low pressure. Now, as this cooled air sinks back down, I'm packing molecules from above into a place that already has molecules. So as I pack these molecules in, they're closer together, making high pressure. So we typically find at the surface of the Earth regions of low pressure where air is moving upwards in a convection cell, and we have high pressure where air is moving down in a convection cell. Now, let's think about what that means in terms of, of water vapor. Uh, well, no, actually, before we do that, we're just going to look at this diagram here. So this is a diagram you could expect to see, I suppose, on the test. Uh, it's basically a um, showing what's called a, a sea breeze. So the idea is during the day, the sun shines on land. Land gets hotter than water does because it has um, a lower specific heat capacity. It's easier to warm it up. So the ground gets warm. If you've ever been to the beach on a, on a sunny day, you know, your feet burn on the sand, but not on the water. Uh, so this gets hot. So hot air rises up, creating some low pressure here. And then over here, the air sinks down where it's cold. Uh, and we end up with high pressure offshore and low pressure onshore. And gases are always pushed from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So if you're standing on the beach trying to fly a kite, the kite would move in this direction here because the wind is blowing off the sea. We call it a sea breeze. Now at night, the opposite would happen. Okay, At, at night, uh, the land, having a low specific heat capacity, would get much colder. The, the, the water would stay the same temperature. And we could get a reversal of this. We could get air rising here and sinking here. But the point is that the wind is simply a function of convection currents. Okay, so here are the parts of the water cycle. Basically, you have evaporation and transpiration. Uh, that's how water gets into the air. Condensation is when water droplets begin to form. Precipitation is when water comes out of the air. Runoff is when water flows across the surface of the earth. And then infiltration is when it moves into the ground. And once it's in the ground, and it reaches a place where uh, 
No, we'll get to it in a minute, but it becomes a thing called groundwater. All right. So let's just talk evaporation. So evaporation happens when solar energy causes surface molecules of a body of water, most of the ocean, but also lakes, rivers, whatever, uh, wet, wet surfaces of concrete. Uh, basically, it jiggles those atoms and it pushes them and energizes them and they go up into the air. Uh, now, since oceans cover over 70% of the Earth's surface, the vast, vast majority, 70% of the water in the water cycle uh, starts off as, as oceanic evaporation. Now, transpiration is, is different. Transpiration is a consequence of, uh, of photosynthesis. So basically, if you recall the formula for photosynthesis, basically in photosynthesis, uh, you have CO2 plus H2O uh, produces C6H, C6H12O6, <laughs> I think I got it right. I should know that, uh, plus O2. But then respiration does the opposite. So when plants respire, they're basically consuming the food they produced. And so in that case, what you have is C6H12O6, nailed it, uh, plus O2, producing CO2 and H2O. So the, the plants breathe out through their stomata. They breathe this water vapor out into the air. So, so when plants eat the food they produce, they respire, they breathe out water vapor. Okay. Now, condensation, and I should say together, we call both evaporation and transpiration. Sometimes we just refer them together as evapotranspiration. This is the mechanism by which water enters uh, the water cycle. All right. Condensation happens basically as hot air moves upwards. Remember, adiabatic cooling happens because the pressure is reduced. It pushes outward. It's doing work. So its internal energy goes down. And the bottom line is, as and if you've been to the mountains, you know this is true. It's cold up there. And when it gets cold enough, you reach a thing called the dew point. It's a, it's a temperature and pressure and humidity point where the water will no longer be able to stay in a vapor form. And it will condense or coalesce in these little tiny droplets. When that, and that basically forms a cloud, or if it happens lower down because uh, it's nighttime or whatever, we call that fog. But it's the same idea. It's this colloidal suspension of water droplets that, that formed when they were no longer able to stay as individual molecules in the air. Now, we see clouds, basically the bottom of the cloud, this is the point at which the temperature and pressure and humidity was such that the water droplets began to condense. And from there up above, the water is going to be uh, in, in, in droplet form rather than in vapor form. So clouds are an example of the condensation phase of this process. Now, as these droplets that make up a cloud get larger and larger and larger, eventually it gets so large they can no longer stay in colloidal suspension. I hope you remember that term from, from uh, chemistry. But basically, a colloidal suspension is it's uh, particles that are larger than, than individual molecules, but small enough that the random motion of air molecules or water molecules are able to keep them suspended. But what happens is these droplets get large enough and they can't stay in the air anymore and they come out of the air, we call that precipitation. Now precipitation can take on many forms. It's safe to just think in terms of rain and snow. There's other forms, but let's just think mainly in terms of rain and in colder places, snow. Interesting enough, in many, many places, most raindrops actually start off as snowflakes in the ground, in the sky. Uh, but anyway, precipitation brings the water back to the ground. So this precipitation falling in this desert in New Mexico, let's just say, probably started off thousands of miles away, evaporating from warm ocean water in, say, the Gulf of Mexico. And then got carried by convection currents uh, from high pressure to low pressure until it, it landed on the ground over here. Now... <clears throat> When precipitation occurs, uh, the water has two choices. It can either run off and return to you know, rivers and therefore the sea, or it can infiltrate and go into the ground. So let's just start off with runoff. So runoff is basically water that is flowing essentially horizontally, we'll say parallel to the surface of the earth because the surface of the earth is necessarily horizontal. So, so this could be just over land, like you sometimes see when it's falling down hard, you just see it running across, say, a sidewalk or dirt. Uh, can also mean, you know, runoff also means rivers and streams. Um, but it turns out most water doesn't do that. Only about a third of the water that comes out of the sky's precipitation is going to go into runoff. The other two thirds of it are going to sink into the ground in a process known as infiltration, which my face is covering up, but okay, it's called infiltration. Uh, you know, and we'll get to this later. The way they've got this course set up, we really, I should have, I should have thought about it. I, this is one of the first presentations I put together, you know, months ago before I really you know, unpacked the curriculum. We'll talk a little bit about the consequences of runoff later in the course. Right now, let's just focus on the process. <clears throat> 
So infiltration, basically, here's the, the surface of the Earth up here. As water sinks in because of gravitational attraction, uh, it basically moves its way between the pore spaces that exist between particles of dirt. Uh, and this process is called infiltration. It's driven by gravity. So whereas runoff is uh, parallel to the surface of the Earth, infiltration is basically parallel to the gravitational force vector. They're going to move downwards for the most part. And as they do it, you know, they slide past these particles. Uh, pollutants tend to get pulled out of them by the clay particles that are in here for reasons we'll talk about later in the year. And so this process of infiltration does have a, a benefit of, 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 to some extent, purifying uh, uh, water. Now, it's worth noting that that quite a bit of the water that, that comes down in, in this process does end up just adhere to the surface here. So there's, there's definitely, um, you know, if you've dug into the dirt, you notice it's damp, right? Most dirt, unless you're in a very arid place, is pretty damp. So there's a bit of the water is sort of caught up just in this area here in, in, the, in a wet dirt. Now, let's just talk briefly about factors affecting the, uh, the, the uh, factors that determine whether you're going to get more runoff or more infiltration. And it makes a lot of sense. If it's steep, you're going to have water moving faster. It's not going to have a chance to infiltrate. But bottom line is the slower water is moving across the surface, the more of it's going to sink in. It just makes sense. So steep areas, high runoff, gradual terrain, uh, less runoff, more infiltration. But there are other factors as well. For instance, how rapidly is the precipitation occurring? So if you have a downpour, it takes a while for water to squeeze its way in between those particles of dirt. So in that case, if you have a heavy rainfall, you're going to get more runoff and less infiltration. But if you get a light, misty, all-day drizzle, then you're going to get more infiltration. You're going to get less runoff. And the other thing that's worth pointing out is vegetation. Vegetation slows the progress of water as water is moving across the surface of the earth when it encounters vegetation it slows down and also it clings to the to the, the branches and leaves and that slows it down so basically what we find is more vegetation means more infiltration and less runoff and again these are some consequences of human actions we're going to deal with those later so let's just talk about groundwater so the unsaturated zone, this means unsaturated with respect to water. So this is the zone of infiltration. It's basically dirt, okay, and, and rock, but loose, loose rock. But basically, here the water is moving straight down. And then you reach a point where, where up here, uh, you have largely air-filled uh, pores between the dirt particles. But there's, you know, as, as water comes in, somewhere down here, there's an impermeable boundary where the water just can't sink anywhere. It's just rock and it can't sink into it. So the water is forced sideways, just like it is on the surface, but much, much slower because it's squeezing between pores. So whereas here, runoff might make it to this surface water here in a matter of minutes or, or at most hours, uh, here, it could take hundreds of years to make this trip that we're seeing right here. All right. So now this zone of saturation here is when we get to what's called groundwater. So, so when the pores are completely filled with water and there's no more air in there, uh, there's no aeration happening here, uh, we call this uh, groundwater. Here, we just call it infiltrating water. The boundary between the zone where infiltration is occurring and where basically where the water is moving down and the saturated zone where water is moving horizontally and all the spaces are filled, we call this boundary the water table. It's the boundary between the saturated uh, sediment, the totally saturated water, and the unsaturated part. Uh, and as I said, uh, you know, it, it, groundwater f flows slowly. Um, I say I used to inches, centimeters, <laughs> centimeters per day. You know, the truth is I hate inches. I don't even know why I put that down there, darn it. Uh, and it is worth noting, and they might ask you this question on the test just to see if you're a knucklehead who didn't get the memo. Groundwater, contrary to what a lot of people think, almost never occurs as underground rivers. It drives me nuts when I hear people say this. It, it, it basically, think of it like this. It's more like a sponge that has water in it, you know, water-filled sponge that's slowly oozing water through it. It's not like there's just this river. Yes, there are places, if you've been to some cool cave areas where you have limestone caves, that is the only place you're ever gonna have underground rivers. Uh, other than that, it's just groundwater flowing through through sediment. Now, now the thing about groundwater is, is because it, it it releases so slowly that that in the dry months you can have rivers continue to flow. You know, if, you know where, where where are rivers coming from? Well, they're coming from groundwater essentially. So it may have rained in these mountains in the winter, and now it's late summer, but that groundwater is still oozing its way through and coming out. So the important thing about groundwater is it feeds. 
river systems. And if you just look at this picture, look where all this life is. Water equals life. And you gotta and you gotta have water, have life. And the nice thing about groundwater is it supplies it over a long period of time. Now, if you follow a stream uphill, eventually it will come to what's called a spring. So it's a place where groundwater is coming out of the earth. Uh, that is known as a, a, a as a spring. T technically, it's where the water table reaches the surface, uh, and, and and at that point, it just becomes runoff and flows through a stream. Uh, I think we already explained this one well enough, so you can look at this on your own. It's just trying to show the difference between the zone of aeration where I have both water and air in the pores and the zone of saturation or groundwater below the water table where the pores are completely filled with water. Here in the zone of aeration, the water is moving downwards because of gravity. Here it's moving sideways, again, because of gravity, but it can't go down anymore because, well, there's water in the way, so it can only go sideways and eventually come out at a spring somewhere. And so here's a picture of this uh, of the of the cycle here. So we can see we have evaporation and transpiration, evaporate transpiration together, moving upwards because of convection caused by the expansion of air when it gets heated. It cools down, uh, and when it does, it condenses into clouds, and a convection system is set up. And so these clouds move over and they precipitate when they get too heavy with with moisture, and now I get some. Uh, surface runoff happening both across the ground and in streams. I get some percolation, which is another word for infiltration. Uh, and then it joins, here's the water table. It becomes groundwater. Some groundwater recharges streams. Some of it just continues to flow here. I see it recharging a lake over here. And I believe, oh yes, I should point out then that, that not all the water that falls on land returns directly to the sea, as we said. So some of it goes into the groundwater. So here's an interesting diagram I showed to you the other day, but let's break it down a little bit more. 97% of all the water on earth is salt water. That means 3% of it is in the, the freshwater stage of the water cycle. All right. Uh, now of that water that precipitates, uh, if it comes down as snow, especially in a polar region or an alpine region where the temperatures stay below freezing most of the year, well, you know what? It's going to stay there. So we get these reservoirs of, of, of fresh water. In fact, almost 80%, 79% of the fresh water on the planet is caught up in uh, continental glaciers, mountain glaciers, and polar ice caps. Uh, and then... 20% of it is trapped in as groundwater. So that basically leaves, of, of, of all the fresh water on Earth, which is only 3% of the total water, only 1% of it is basically uh, able to be at the surface at all. And even of that, uh, most of that ends up in lakes or as soil moisture. So just a small amount of it ends up uh, running off in rivers. So basically, fresh water is of vital importance to, to terrestrial life. Uh, and uh, so... Of the, of the world's fresh water, 79% of it is caught up in glaciers and ice caps, 20% of it is groundwater. Now that groundwater does feed rivers, uh, which is important, but at any point in time, only about 1% of the fresh water on the planet is actually accessible, apart from the, the uh, you know, I should take that back because a lot of it is accessible as soil moisture. Okay, guys, uh, let me see if I can figure out how to turn this off. I, when I hide that thing, I lose my way of turning this off. So I apologize if there's going to be a little bit of lag time while I try to figure out how to exit out of this. Come on, let me turn it off. Now I, I'm going to click my face. I'm going to click the X near my face. And then this. Did that do it? I don't know if I turned it off yet or not. No, 